Hey, welcome back. Oh man, you're gonna love this today. We have a vagabond back with us, guy who's been on at least twice, but he has been one busy dude. My name is Vin DeQuino. Our guest today is the amazing author, Frank Hickey. Hello, man. Frank, welcome home, man. Thank you very much. Frank, you have been all over the place. I've been trying to get a hold of you so you could do your new book, but you have been a traveling man. Yes. Tell me a little bit about what you've been doing and where you've been. All right. Last year, <laughs> I started in Indonesia. Oh, my God. I landed in Jakarta because Indonesia is a country I knew nothing about, and most people know nothing about it. Yeah. And I traipsed around a little bit there, went to Borneo, which is part oh Indonesian, part Malaysia, saw orangutans in the preserve. Oh, my God. Did a jungle walk. Oh, my God. Got caught in rain, uh -huh. real rainstorms. Every night in Borneo, a hurricane-like storm hit wow. at sundown. Every wow. night. Every night. Oh, my God. And the people were asking me, there, are you sleeping outdoors in a tent? <laughs> Which would be impossible. <laughs> and the people in Borneo are happily going through life on their motorcycles every day, motorbikes, in the middle of this torrential rain and oh thunder and lightning. God. Wow. So why, why travel? You just want to, to finally lot. see the world. Right. There's so much to see in the world. Yeah, there is. And I was always a traveler. Ever since I could raise my thumb to hitchhike, wow. the world opened up for me, starting wow. right here in the States. So we, we have some pictures. Uh, and then you can tell me a little bit about some of these places you visited. Sure. Uh, you sent me some pictures. And here you are doing your famous Max dance. Right. <laughs> this was in China, where I'd wow. gotten cleaned up after most of my travels. Yeah, look, uh, look a before and after exactly we have Exactly, before here. and after. And most cities in China have public dancing morning, noon, and night. Really? I've seen people in large cities dancing in the square at 9 o'clock in the morning. Wow. Where exactly in China? That, the, uh, those pictures, one was in Beihai on the coast where I still have the beard. The other on the right-hand side was, is in Shenzhen, a large city right near Hong Kong. So did you go with the beard and then shave it? Or? I grew the beard to protect my skin against yeah. the fierce jungle sun yeah. and the beach communities, and it grew and grew and grew and grew. And then all the people around you did not have beards. No, very, no. very few. Very Some of the few. Europeans would sport beards because they were on vacation. Yeah. But the locals, no. No, wow. Okay, so then we did, now where, where is this? Look at the beard. Come <laughs> on, that Frank. Beard. That's, that's only six months uh, duration of a beard. <laughs> that is in the town of Sanshand in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, outer Mongolia. Outer Mongolia. You know, since I was a kid, the, they used to joke about that. They used to say, keep it up, you're going to end up in outer Mongolia. So there's outer Mongolia. You actually got oh, yeah. outer Mongolia. I found it a fascinating country. Really? What's it like? It's very hard to describe in a sentence. It has beautiful mountains. Wow. It has lush green areas. It has desert. Even the desert has green spots to it with rivers running through it. It has sand dunes. Many Europeans, many Americans are addicted to going back and forth to Mongolia. I wow. can see why. Yeah, I, I can see why too. So uh, now you, you look like a priest over here. <laughs> uh, tell me about that one. That's in Seoul, South Korea at the Seoul Book Fair where I was ca carrying around uh, copies of my book and showing it to people, and they were, were very interested in anything American, anything contemporary. It was the same way in Mongolia. And I kept writing all the time when I was traveling. Wow. And now, look at you. Hey, cousins! <laughs> <laughs> Along with being fascinated with Mongolia, I always wanted to get close to a yak, close enough to pet one. So here, I realized my dream here. And this is in the morning. Even in the summertime, the mornings and the evenings are cool, sometimes cold in Mongolia with completely unpredictable weather. Wow. And this, uh, oh, you're a little closer to that yak. A close-up to the yak. Right. I didn't want to get too close. Yeah, yeah. I believe that. <laughs> I didn't know how dangerous a yak bite could be. <laughs> yeah. So now where did you stay when you were in these places? I stayed in a variety of places. In Borneo, I would stay in... Uh, pretty good hotels, but usually you have to stay wherever you can find a place. Wow. Only two and nights were spent outdoors. Yes, well, I needed sun protection, and the sun was fierce there. 
a lot of people told me I looked very different from my passport picture, which was true. Uh, wow, look at that. Jeez. Now, uh, okay, uh, I think we have another one. Oh, look at this. That's the yurt, as it's called by some people. The Mongolians call them gurs. They are their living quarters made out of pressed fur and canvas. Wow. And I wish to report they are not rainproof. <laughs> oh, no. I found oh, no. out. Yeah. Wow. All right. Uh, we have another? Nope. Nope? No. Okay, so. Maybe it. So now, so you traveled all that way. How long were you actually gone? A year. A whole year. I was year. gone a year. Wow. It's a long time. Now, did you do any writing there? Oh, yes. I write every day. Uh, uh, wow. Bad or good or indifferent, so I write you, every day. Did you keep journals? I kept a journal along with the, the novels that I was writing, yes. Wow, wow. Doing both. So now those journals might someday get work their way into some of your books. They might, but I was using the locations I was in as backgrounds for my novels. Oh, wow. All right, so let's talk about your novels. You, it's been almost a year, maybe more than a year, yeah. two or three years yep. since you were here. So tell me about what you've been doing in those two or three years. I've been yep. writing other books All right. about Max Royster, the world's only ballroom dancing detective. So how many Max Royster books have you written now? We've got eight published now. Eight, oh my God. Number nine is coming out very soon. Wow, so you were here on while ago. So tell me about, just fill me in on the Max Royster. Who is Max Royster in your book? Max Royster is the ultimate civilian. <laughs> he was a policeman for a very short period of time. You were a policeman for a very long period That's of time. That's right. <laughs> and he said that he spent most of his time on suspension or on sick leave <laughs> or hiding from the bosses. And he uses his native common sense and New York street smarts to solve mysteries to solve crimes. He is always broke. <laughs> he is always beset by calamities that follow all of us. And he's very much a New York everyman. He's, got no, he's not a superhero. He's in his 60s. He's divorced. He's paunchy. He's a drinker. He's a cigar smoker. <laughs> he is nobody's idea of a superhero. <laughs> or a lot of people's idea, exactly. idea of a superhero. Exactly. Uh, so, uh, so you have like eight books in the series. Yes. And his adventures just keep going on. Yes, they do. So now, most recently, mm -hmm. you did uh, Max Dancing. Right. Uh, tell me about that book. Sure. He's changed his name legally, finally. He got the money enough to go to <laughs> City Hall and change his name from Max Royster to Dancing Max Royster. Oh. <laughs> this is not very difficult in New York. You can no, call you yourself can change, yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte if or you want to. Joe Garbage. Exactly. Whatever you want to. And he learns all of a sudden that he is a father Ooh. and that his daughter has been kidnapped by radicals in the South Pacific island of Guadalcanal. And now that part of the story is true, right? <laughs> <laughs> These are fiction books. Oh, fiction These books. These are sorry, fiction sorry. books. He's also got red hair and doesn't look like me and has a mustache. No, oh, just a mustache. No beard. No beard. Oh, that's good. And he, I thought maybe you shaved it off because no, no. you were getting identified or something. <laughs> and he must go to Guadalcanal and look, search for his only daughter. Oh, wow. Because she's been wow. kidnapped, as I said, by radicals. Wow, that's like the Liam Neeson uh, movies, you know, where he has to save his daughter from all, all these things. It's a very strong motive. Yeah, It's a very yeah. strong motive. Yep, yep. Uh, so, interesting. So, now, again, now you wrote most of that book when you were... I wrote most of that book when I was in Malaysia and Indonesia. Wow, wow. That's amazing. Uh, and, and I would imagine you do it on a computer. I do it on my phone. Really? Which is this big. Oh, that's wild. I did not have a laptop. Wow. And where there was no electricity, when storms would come in yeah. and knock out the electricity, I was living on a one kilometer long jungle and beach island, which was beset by the, the winds and the storms sometimes. Then we'd go back to notebook and pen. Wow. That's how I did Kiss the Candy Days, all notebook and pen, because 20 years ago, Writing on a computer was not easy. Correct. Actually, that was almost 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it was a it was a different world. 
Uh, now, just tell me a little bit about the the precursors, the books, some of those books that were were not here last time you were here. The Gypsy Twist was right. the one that. Oh, these in particular. Yeah. These no. are the new ones, as I said right. before. Yeah. So let's let, let's hold this up. Uh, I'll let you do that. Sure thing. This way they can get a look at that cover. Uh, let's see. We'll focus right in. There we go. And there it is. And this is the Max Wisecracks. Now, uh, you've written another one since that, right? Yes. Oh, man, you know, what do you do with your spare time? <laughs> <laughs> I admire writers that can keep putting out good books. Yeah, that's right. I really I mean, do. It, and, and it's, when I'm behind that computer writing, I'm in my own world, man. It, it is a wonderful world. Understood. And you, and you're, you're able to do some things that other people can't do. Now, uh, let's hold this one up. We've got another sure. one here. Tell me a little bit about that one. We haven't talked about this one at all. This one also deals with a police, alleged police brutality case that happens during the Christmas season in Manhattan. And police brutality, alleged police brutality, is oh, a very wow. controversial, hot yes. topic. Yeah, I mean, it's so easy to be accused of it. And yet when you're in there, we talked about this the last time, when you're in that situation, you think somebody's pulling out a gun, man, you have to act quick. If you act too quickly, people are going to say, you are too quick. If not, the whole city will come to your funeral. Yes. But, you know, the thing is, you don't want that funeral. No. <laughs> and neither do we. And yet, when you do act, you're going to get in trouble for saving your own life. So it's very difficult. It's a touchy situation. You have to act on the spot, and you have to make some pretty serious decisions on the spot. What I like about your books, those I have read, are that there's expertise, and you know what you're talking about, and you try to be as realistic as possible in situations that have to do with police activity. Yes. Uh, I've seen a lot of these books where they don't know what they're talking about. They, there was no way that they were going to, that police would do what they say they do. Uh, you know the procedures. You know what needs to be done, what would be done, what you'd be in trouble for doing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Almost everything. <laughs> yeah, almost everything. <laughs> I wish to add that. Yeah. So let's go back to your life a little bit. All right. When did this all start? You, were you a kid cop? I always, no, I was, I was not a kid cop. I always wanted to be a detective. I think we spoke about this last time. It goes back to Peter Gunn. Yeah, oh God, I remember Peter Gunn. Because I understood Gunn. nothing about Peter Gunn except the music and the fact that he didn't have to pick up his room when his mother told him to and that he had a great life hanging out at nighttime with Henry Mancini's music <laughs> pulsing in the background. I said, that looks like a good life. <laughs> yeah, and really. I haven't matured much since those days. And <laughs> nothing has changed except I've gotten older. And I became a private investigator when I was 22. Oh, wow. And even though there was no money in it, I really, really wanted to work murder defense cases, wow. which is what I did. So, so were these like, you know, the woman comes in with a with the little hat and says, my husband has been cheating on me. Oh, no. And oh, no. no, you don't do those. Murder huh? defense. I yeah. still don't know what the divorce yeah. laws are in any state. <laughs> so there it's, you go. I never had to learn them. Yeah. What we did, what I did primarily was go into the inner city neighborhoods when a person was accused of a homicide and usually was in Rikers Island because they couldn't afford bail money. And I would try to pick up the pieces as to what really happened, speaking Spanish sometimes, and overcoming distrust, hostility, and I was afraid all the time. Yeah. I was 22, I you wore were... thick glasses, I had a Mickey Mouse t-shirt on. Oh my God. I didn't know how to drive a car at this point. Really? I never touched a gun in my life. I was not the TV private detective. Wow, wow. So you were a private detective before you were a cop? Oh yes, for 10 years. Wow. Wow. So you don't need special training to be a PI? In New York at that time, and it may still be this way, you can work under somebody else's license wow. if you're under 25. It's like an apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah, sure. And there are, uh, I think real estate is somewhat the same way, and some of the physical crafts are that way. You do an apprenticeship, and when you break 25, you can apply for your own private eye license. Wow. 
It's a, it was cool. a fascinating business in the 70s. It's still a fascinating business, but back then it abounded with all kinds of colorful Broadway characters. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, so you did PI, and then you became a cop. Then I became an investigator for the district attorney's office. So you were never a, a B cop. Yes, I was. Oh, you were. Yes, I was. Wow. I did everything backwards in my life. Yeah. <laughs> After being an, a detective for quite a while, I went into uniform, first in Savannah, Georgia, as a police officer there, wow. and then later in Los Angeles as a police officer there. So was Savannah, Georgia as haunted as they say it is? It was pretty well haunted. We, yeah, we had ghost houses. We had a character dressed up as Dracula who went around Forsyth Park every night. Wow. Uh, we had some officers who would not respond to calls at the cemetery after dark. Oh, man. And I there believe is that feeling. I did hauntings of the Hudson River Valley, and I was amazed that I was selling more books in Savannah, Georgia, than I was in New York because those people love their ghosts, man. And it's always been a literary town. Yeah. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote part of Treasure Island there. Oh, really? Richard, Je well, as you may remember from the book, Flint was hanged at Savannah. Yeah, Captain yeah. Captain Flint was hanged at Savannah. The pirate's house still stands where Robert Louis Stevenson lived. Richard Jessup, who wrote The Cincinnati Kid, grew up there. Flannery O'Connor's house is still there. Wow. Uh, Conrad Aiken grew up there, called it the most magical of cities. Oh, I can imagine. So it, for a small city, it does have an awful yeah, lot of writing. Someday I want to get there. Uh, the stories are fascinating. Yes, they are. You know, and uh, they, they love their ghosts. Uh, all right, so then you were a beat cop yes. in Savannah, Georgia, uh, and then what? Then I went back to being a detective in New York City, and once again, I think that as a patrol officer, you learn things you will never learn anywhere else in the world. Wow. So when Los Angeles offered me a slot in their academy, wow. at the age of 42, I said, let's see if I can get through the seven-month academy. <laughs> I did not think I could. Wow. Somehow. But you did. So I've, I visited the Academy Chapel an awful lot. Yeah. You were 42 then, you I said? was 43 when I finished the 42. Academy. Wow. And wow. I dropped 30 pounds and lost five inches off my stomach. Wow. Jeez, maybe I should join the Academy. <laughs> maybe I should now. <laughs> no, and, you just keep hanging around the yaks. You'll lose it. <laughs> and then I did my probation year in the Hollenbeck area where they filmed Colors. And then I did 11 years in the Southwest Division where they filmed Training Day. It seemed like the movies were following me or I was following the movies. I don't remember which. And it was fascinating, frightening, colorful, important, valuable times. Yeah. And, I mean, that's what being an author is about. Seeing the world, l learning things. And, and, again, it's not what you've seen. It's what you've learned emotionally and the sense you can get from these experiences. Yes. And then you incorporate them in your books. Yes. Are there, do you actually use some of the experience that you've had in the books? I will use some that have happened to me. Well, I will not use some that have happened to others because I don't yeah. want to embarrass people. Yeah, yeah. And having worked in so many different areas. And even changing the name to protect okay. the innocent. Everything's changed. Everything's, Everything's changed. changed. It's very hard to pinpoint when something happened at that time because I worked in different places. Yeah, that's But true. I do use the warp and the woof, the atmosphere of the street. And as you mentioned before, I, very few writers know that. Yep. Now, do you change your fictional places or do most of your books take place in the same fictional city? Or Well, we've got, okay, that's a good question. They started out in New York. <laughs> yeah. And two are in, set in California. Even the first one in New York had parts of it in New Orleans. Yeah. Where I was a private detective. And San Francisco, the same thing. And I spent a month in Guadalcanal in the South Pacific. Wow. And that gave me enough to write. Uh, the new the book that's coming out soon, which is uh, Dancing Max Hits Guadalcanal, or When in Doubt, Rumba. <laughs> Tell me about that book. That book is, as I said, when his daughter is kidnapped, and his cover, because he doesn't want, they are having ethnic tension, which also erupted when I was there, wow. where for the first time in its history, people were killing police officers oh, and ambushing them. Oh, Just happenstance that I happened to be there when that was happening. 
and throughout all this, Max has got to thread his way through, pretending to be nothing more than a dance teacher. Wow. He enlists the help of a beautiful Melanesian woman and a Thompson submachine gun left over from World War II. Oh my God. When I was in Guadalcanal, I made friends with the police officers there, did a walk along with them, inspected their headquarters, met their chief, and the head of the explosive division told me that every month they find an unexploded Japanese or American bomb in the oh ground. God. Every month. Every month. Holy cow. And I myself was brought through the jungle by some children, and they showed me war relics of a Japanese tank and cartridges. And they thought it was a car. I knew it was a tank. And they offered me the bullets to take home. Wow. If you're caught taking war souvenirs out of Guadalcanal, it's a three-year prison sentence. Good Lord. I would have interviewed you there. That's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I decided Lord. to let them stay where they yeah. were. Good idea. Yes. Uh, wow. So all these experiences, uh, you have journals to document them. Uh, are there some that are absolutely emblazoned in your brain, uh, things that you just too hard to ever forget? Yes, I think every police officer has those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it almost a relief to retire? <laughs> yes, yes yeah. it was. Yeah, because it's scary. I mean, you're putting your life on the line every time you're out there. Everyone says that, Vin, but what they don't realize is your tranquility goes a lot for, uh, faster than your life does. Hmm. No matter what you do, if you're on the street in patrol in any town, it changes you. And yeah. this is just after two years. Yeah any town. There's probably a reason why the average American man lives to be 77 and the average American policeman lives to be 59. Oh, that's not good news. No, that's not good news. No, no. That, I mean, we lose young officers all the time here. I, I hate hearing about, you know, these policemen that, you know, you've seen them driving by your house and then two weeks later they're gone. Uh, that's scary. Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a long life, and now you just finished a new book. Yes. And I'm sure in the back of your head, the next one's cooking. What's cooking? Well, I haven't written anything in two and a half hours. Oh, on come on, on Frank, you lazy thing. Well, I've been speaking with you. <laughs> That's why. Pushing the book. Now, do you go out and talk about these? I mean, do you Yes, do I do. Book yes, talks and book signings. I was doing that all through Asia. Oh, really? All wow. through Asia. And showing clips of and this showing, show, right? which is wild. You know, we've had guests from all over the world. We really have. Uh, we had a uh, shaman from uh, uh, Austria, and he was showing all his shows to the people there. We have people from England who are here, and they meet in a pub. And they watch the show, they have the pub order, put it up on the TV, and they sit there and have their pints and watch the, uh, watch the show all the way in London. So it's wild, and it gets around. And now with you know, YouTube, it makes it a lot easier. So that's a message to you out there. Uh, if you want to see this show again and you want other people to see it, you can go on to YouTube. It'll be there probably later today. And just go on and look under one-on-one. -on -one with Frank Hickey, and it'll show up. Uh, and it's always fun to watch. Even your old shows are on there. Uh, you were way back in the beginning. We've done now about 140-something uh, one-on-ones. But you were even back here when the show was called uh, Let's Talk Writing. Yes. So you're an oldie but goodie, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> so any more travel in the, or are you back home to stay for a while? I plan to go back. Oh, man. Very soon. Oh, very really? Soon. Yes. Really? Yeah. Pick up where I left off and keep wow. traveling. Wow. So will you go back to Outer Mongolia or you just I will probably go, go back to new to, places? No, I will go back to China and pick China. up my path. And finish dancing with that woman? Finish dancing. <laughs> I, I love the dancing scene in China. I wish we had it in America. I know. That's right. one thing that should be exported yeah, here. Yeah, really. So where do they dance? I mean, they have like in local parks, clubs or something? In parks. In parks. Wow. Public parks. You do not need to speak the language, which is 
fortunate. And dancing and you, is a language. Right, exactly. And you do not need to know the people. It's just wow. understood that you would yeah. dance. Wow. And I would go into a group when I was wearing my travel outfit of shorts and a t-shirt and speak. And two minutes later, I'd be doing a Viennese waltz wow. with somebody around the, around the public Where square. Where did you learn to dance? I learned to dance mostly in New York and Los Angeles. Wow. My mother was a Broadway actress. Wow. And she was a dance teacher with Fred Astaire and Arthur Murray. Wow. Uh, and your sister's active, too. Yes. Uh, McGee Hickey is a, an, I hope I could say this. Channel 11. Channel 11. Uh, and she, uh, uh, I, I had a wonderful opportunity of being on a radio show with you. Mm -hmm. And your sister called in. And the three of us were talking to each other. I'd forgotten about and, that. And she was making me laugh, you know, talking about what you were like when you were younger. <laughs> and it was kind of one of those, oh, Frankie. <laughs> that was, I didn't want that to turn into family hour. <laughs> no, but it was fun because it gave us a little background of who you are and what you do. You are one of the honest-to-goodness adventurers who appreciate life and capture it in writing. So I urge every one of our listeners to read your books, get to know who you are. Uh, now the bad news. You've got about a minute and a half, Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you have to say to these wonderful people? The best kick I get out of being a writer is when somebody comes up to me and says, Frank, I liked your book. I remember when The Gypsy Twist came out, the first book, it was a... Uh, cloudy, rainy, thunder and lightning kind of day in Brooklyn. I was walking wetly uh, through Prospect Park, and the park was deserted. And behind me, I hear a voice saying, hey, Frank, I finished your book. It's uh, really good. <laughs> I know. I love it. I, was, I just did a book signing for my new book, Patriot Hero. And uh, I was in an antique bookstore, books from the like 1800s. And it was raining, and they had wine out on their front porch. And these people were all mingling and getting together. And I was like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> That's know, right. I want to stay right here. And that memory will stay with me like forever. Yes. Frank, what a pleasure having you here, man. It's always a pleasure. Thank and you. And the show is always way too short. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank you all for being here today. Thank you for being one-on-one -on -one with the great Frank Hickey. Uh, if you're ever in outer Mongolia, have a drink with him or sit with a yak. Frank, pleasure, man. Thank you. You were a great guest. You always are. Come back. Thank you. I will. I, come and talk about your next 10 books. All right. I will. <laughs>